All right, it is noon. Welcome everyone to the Iowa Learning Farms webinar. My name is Elena Whitaker and I'm the Water and Conservation Educator with Iowa Learning Farms. Uh, we're here today to talk, uh, we're here today to hear from John Dahlem, who is a postdoctoral research associate with Iowa Learning Farms, all about how the social sciences can help conserve butterflies and more. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll get them asked at the end of the presentation. Otherwise, with that, I'll hand it over to you, John. Okay, great. Sorry there, I was just having a little issue with Zoom. Um, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Uh, so the purpose of this presentation is really to reflect on how the social sciences can uh, inform butterfly conservation, um, but also conservation for any number of species or ecosystems. Um, and just to kind of reflect broadly on that topic, I, um, I will, the presentation will focus around um, a particular case study that I've looked at in depth uh, of a particular butterfly species in Washington state um, called the island marble butterfly. Uh, but as I do that, I will try to kind of um, draw out how some of these social conditions I'm talking about might be relevant to other kinds of conservation efforts and particularly relevant to Iowa. So I'll talk a little bit about Iowa migratory monarch butterflies, hopefully. But as I'm doing all of this, I hope that you'll think a little bit about uh, the social conditions I'm talking about and how they might be the same in Iowa or might be different in the uh, Iowan context. And that'd be something I'd be interested in hearing more from you about or maybe having a conversation about if, if sort of relevant. But to kind of give you a sense of sort of uh, where the social sciences are at with regard to conservation or where conservation social science is at, that sort of four article titles here. Um, about every three or four years, an article is produced that sort of reflects on this topic, uh, provides a kind of general overview. And this is because, um, you know, we've, we're at about, you know, 20 or 30 years of conservation social science uh, being produced, uh, sociologists, psychologists, economists, um, but still we're not seeing the social sciences meaningfully integrated into conservation practice, I think, fully. Um, and so I'll draw your attention to the bottom right article here. This is an article for, from the journal Conservation Biology. Uh, it's titled Exploring the Emergence of a Tipping Point for Conservation with Increased Recognition of Social Considerations. And so this is a 2023 article. What the authors have done is they've interviewed a lot of conservationists um, and they've you know, asked them you know, sort of about the general state of conservation. And they have heard from them that almost unanimously, people are interested more and more in addressing these social considerations and addressing them from some kind of a you know, empirical perspective or a, a scientific perspective if possible. And I think this comes you know, naturally from, uh, you know, a couple decades of, or a few decades really of, of conservation science, not really producing all of the results that we maybe thought. Certainly we've had some successes. You think about things like the bald eagle. We've also maybe had some, some backsliding. So, you know, uh, thinking about, I don't know, uh, witnessing fewer um, fireflies or something like this, or certainly young people watching uh, climate change unfold uh, in a more and more tangible sense or ocean acidification or some of these problems that haven't really been solved despite the science produced about them. And I think the sentiment is, is uh, summed up really well from, uh, by a quote um, here from uh, uh, a prominent environmentalist uh, and a lawyer, uh, Gus Speth. And he says, uh, I used to think that the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, uh, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought that 30 years of good science could address these problems. And I was wrong. Uh, the top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with these, we need a cultural and spiritual transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. And I think Gus Spath is referring to natural scientists here. Um, and I understand the sort of helplessness in looking at some of these issues from a scientific perspective. They do appear to sort of defy a scientific inquiry. Um, however, there is, you know, close to a century or, or a century of, of, of social scientific research on issues such as selfishness and greed and apathy, certainly, but also things like cultural transformations. There's an entire uh, subfield of sociology that looks at social change and social movements. Um, so we do know quite a lot about how cultural uh, transformation takes place. You might also think about things like, you know, a corporation's ability to get people off of the couch to, to go and buy a product or um, a politician's ability to get you to vote for them, um, or a social movement's ability to get people out into the streets uh, from time to time. So certainly there are people who understand how to go about these uh, uh, kinds of, uh, addressing these kinds of issues. And, and certainly there's a lot of social science, scientific sort of ink spilled about these topics. So it's, it's not sort of hopeless. So, you know, where do we start? Um, uh, 
So I, I conducted a case study of a, of a conservation effort around a butterfly species because I was interested in sort of the social components of, of, of butterfly conservation. In Washington state, you can see the butterfly there. It's the island marble butterfly. And the book uh, that came out last October that kind of details all of this. You can, you can find that online uh, if you're interested. It's called The Good Green Gold of Spring. And The Good Green Gold of Spring is just the translation of the Latin name of the island marble butterfly. So it makes for a nice little title there. I'll give you some, some key facts about the island marble here in a second, but just to talk methodology uh, quickly. When, you, when you're in the social sciences, um, it's very difficult. Uh, you're still using the scientific method, but of course the social world is just full of so many variables that it's hard to control for them. It's hard to keep track. Um, there is quantitative research that is turning things into quantities, turning things into numbers and using statistics to analyze them. That's a lot of survey research uh, or experimental research. And there's also qualitative, that's sort of everything else that could be considered social data. Um, so if you think about it, if you wanted to assess something like happiness, you could send out a survey and say, on a scale of one to 10, um, how happy do you feel? Or how many days of the last two weeks have you felt happy, right? And you have that quantitative uh, kind of data that, that, that arrives from that. Um, or you could interview people and you could say, well, tell me about what it feels like for you to be happy. Or uh, tell me about a time when you were happy, right? And you're going to find out a different piece of information from that other kind of data. And so uh, it gets a little messier, but it's still relevant. And that's what I kind of tried to do with this is try to explore the data that you wouldn't get from a survey. And hopefully that'll... Um, uh, that'll uh, be obvious from some of the discussions that I have, um, the, the more in-depth kind of data, uh, but, but also case specific. Uh, so I used kind of ethnographic observation that is spending as much time as I could uh, in and around this butterfly conservation effort, taking notes on everything that sort of happened around me, uh, in-depth interviews with, with everyone I, I could find who had anything to do professionally or on a voluntary basis with the butterfly or even people who had you know, uh, done artistic representations of the butterfly. Uh, participant observation that is spending time with these people and, and doing kind of what they do a little bit and archival research that's basically reading everything I could that had to do with the butterfly. I'll give you some interesting case facts here um, and they're quite interesting. Uh, so the butterfly species was thought extinct for nearly 100 years before being rediscovered in 1998, believe it or not. Um, so pretty fascinating uh, case of kind of a rebirth here, nice little narrative. Um, when I was there in 2018, uh, conducting this research, the rough population estimates were in the high hundreds. That's that's not very good. That's that's very few uh, butterflies, uh, with a significant portion of those reared in captivity. So the same way you can imagine uh, raising butterflies in those like netted containers, you're able to do that for these severely endangered species as well, and release those butterflies out into the wild. Uh, it spends about uh, over 300 days of the year in its chrysalis, in this tiny little chrysalis attached to, um, you know, a plant. Uh, and only flies as a butterfly for for two weeks. Uh, so it it, it closes, uh, flies out, uh, mates, lays eggs, and only exists as the butterfly that we know as like this sort of charismatic microfauna for only about two weeks out of its life, which has a lot of social impacts. Um, importantly, it only persists on San Juan Island, Washington, and that's one island among the San Juan Islands, um, uh, uh, an, an island chain off Washington. Um, and only there, when I was there, was it in American Camp, which is a small historical park on a peninsula of that island. So really, its habitat is very restricted. It may have it may have moved out to other uh, other uh, elements of the islands uh, by now. Uh, it relies largely on non-native host plants for survival. And also importantly, it was federally listed and endangered in May of 2020. And that's important because it's very difficult for a species to become endangered. Uh, and also the Trump administration uh, listed very few species. And that's because there are lots of social impacts, of course, uh, of listing species. So very political. Um, this is a kind of map to help you orient yourself down there in the bottom right, you'll see Seattle. Uh, and so if you sort of travel upward uh, along the water, that bolded or, or solid line is going to be the US-Canada border. So the San Juan Islands, that, that marker there is, is American Camp National Park, uh, right there on the peninsula on the southern part of that island. Um, so it's it's about as Northwest as you can get in the contiguous United States and really relegated to that, that tiny part of, of that uh, of Washington state. So small habitat. This is what it looks like to be out in that island chain. It's very beautiful. It's kind of idyllic Pacific Northwest landscape, uh, pines, uh, steep slopes, the clear water. Uh, this is what American Camp looks like from the water. Uh, you can see there's a lighthouse. It's a recreational park as well as an historical park. That's what people use it for. Uh, there are prairies there um, where the butterfly can persist. There are also short grass mowed by rabbits where foxes hang out. It's an interesting place. Um, this is what the captive rearing lab looks like. You can see these tiny little chrysalises connected to these sticks. Um, if this were out on a, on a plant, you'd be hard pressed to identify it probably if, if you weren't familiar. Uh, you might walk right by it or, or mow right over it, as we'll talk about. And this is what the, the butterfly looks like itself, the island marble. Um, it's this 
cute little butterfly, right? It's got this fuzzy little face, these fuzzy wings, these distinct patterns, although they are the patterns of the large marble, it's it's a uh, broader species and uh, you know, cute antenna and colored eye. So what I wanna do here uh, is, is kind of uh, talk about some selected uh, social findings that I found. And what I'll, I'll, the way I'll organize this is I'll talk about some sort of causes, social causes of its endangerment, then move to kind of talking about the social um, factors that are relevant when you're actually on the ground and doing conservation. So what are the conservationist sort of social factors they're dealing with? And then talk about maybe some of the solutions that, that social science can, can provide or sociology can provide. So the first kind of cause of endangerment, social cause of endangerment I wanna talk about is lack of public awareness. And I'll, I'll work through these using quotes largely from the interviews. So we have some expert opinions here. So this is from a forestry officer and conservationist. He says, the part that people have so much trouble with is this is a resident butterfly. You know, people know about monarchs and they think that when they don't see butterflies, they're gone. But the island marble is on San Juan 365 days of the year. And on every day of the year, there's something that you can do that would kill it. People don't understand that the butterfly is still there when you can't see it, right? So it's invisible. It's, it's, it is visible if you look closely and you know what to look for. Otherwise, it looks like a thorn or something like this. And so you might imagine that in, around February, you might look out at, at some, you know, uh, kind of rough part of uh, of the yard and say, well, let's it's, let's mow that away because it's not going away itself. And, and if you do that, you might mow over dozens of a critically endangered species. And I, I say this because it did happen and is uh, explained to me to be uh, sort of the historical record of how it was uh, um, removed ultimately from one of the other islands in the, in the chain, Lopez Island, is that uh, they mowed for, for fairly reasonable reasons uh, to, to be able to set up fireworks and not have to worry about uh, you know, the brush catching fire. Uh, so mowed over them and then uh, mowed a, um, a schoolyard, uh, uh, just edging a, a schoolyard, a groundskeeper uh, took care of uh, another population of island marbles. So public awareness, you can't take care of something if you don't know it's there, right? So conservation uh, requires awareness, um, especially when you're talking about landowners. So here's an interesting case to kind of broaden this away from the island marble um, of the zebra mussel, which of course is a, a non-native species that's sort of uh, sweeping the United States. It's uh, very detrimental to freshwater systems in the United States. Um, so here's an article from the Duluth News Tribune. It says, Minnesota effort uh, to slow aquatic invasive species is working. Most boaters are taking action to slow the spread of aquatic invasive species, and only 8% of Minnesota lakes are infested. Uh, so sort of celebrating a success here. Um, the picture is actually interesting. It's of the dog being able to smell the mussels on these boats, which is fascinating. Um, but what's happening here is another issue of visibility. Uh, the mussels very inconveniently, their offspring are essentially microscopic and also inconveniently they attach themselves to things like watercraft. So if you go out in the land of a thousand lakes and you take your boat into one of the lakes and you think, okay, well, I'll, I'll take another, uh, the boat out again on Friday to a different lake, you may introduce those zebra mussels into that new lake uh, without knowing. So it's very important for, for, for this public outreach to take place. And actually we can see the social scientific components of this uh, have effects. Um, in the different uh, rates of spread that we see across states. So for example, Minnesota here celebrating a success a few years ago. Um, Montana, I think has similar success. I'm not, I'm not an expert, uh, but South Dakota uh, lamenting their lack of education on this subject um, uh, because it is, again, it's about outreach and it's about individual behavior. Another thing that we could think about is maybe monarchs and the fact that you know while they're uh, not visible because they're of course not here, they will eventually be here. And so they do require that habitat, even if they're not uh, visible at, at this time, right? They are going to come through Iowa or come uh, stay in Iowa. Another cause of endangerment that's inherently social is the idea of sort of waiting until listing to conserve. And by listing, I mean listing under the uh, uh, Federal Endangered Species Act. Um, so uh, are we going to wait until the government comes down and says, you need to, by law, uh, conserve the species, or are we going to try to protect a species before a listing happens? And so with the island marble, actually, they petitioned to have it listed in the late 2000s, and that petition was shot down, as it, as it is for many species for many reasons. In the late 2010s, it was, of course, accepted, and, and the species was listed in 2020. But uh, here's a quote from a nonprofit leader sort of uh, talking about some of the consequences. He says, I liken it to, you know, this was 2004 and 2005. This was a patient that needed chemo, uh, but it was operable cancer. Now we're like stage five cancer. I think the verdict is still out whether this butterfly goes extinct. Uh, and I think it is the fault of humans. It's the fault uh, or it's this inaction and inability to act that has got us to this point, right? So he's kind of pointing out that, well, without the Endangered Species Act and without that uh, legitimacy and without that that impetus, then... Uh, potentially the the, the uh, conservation efforts suffered. And we do know that during this 20 year period, uh, the butterfly's population did decline uh, due in part to certain uh, events like uh, storm surge 
um, but uh, in large part to the fact that there, there weren't, uh, you know, as many resources available as could have been. So I think another, you know, again, broadening this discussion out, I think another example here that, that's interesting is that of harbor seals. So harbor seals for, for uh, conservation watchdog groups are considered a species of least concern, meaning uh, there are plenty of harbor seals. They're, they're doing all right, especially when we consider the current state of a lot of other species. Uh, but we also know at this moment in, in you know, 2023 that some populations are in steep, steep decline, as much as 86%, that we're seeing the disappearance of harbor seals. So even though we're starting from a point of having a large number of harbor seals, we're losing a lot of harbor seals. So we could be at a point, I don't know, 10 or 15 years from now, where we look back and we say, well, why didn't we do anything about harbor seals? And I think the difficulty is, you know, we don't really react. We tend not to react until the species is at that threatened point. So again, you know, monarchs, we've, we've known that they're going to be threatened for quite some time. Now they've reached that point where they are endangered. Of course, they're not listed yet, but they are considered endangered. So a similar kind of uh, phenomenon happening there. Are we going to protect species or are we going to wait until we're told to do so or forced to do so? That listing process is also inherently quite social. So the, the politics of listing is something I think that's also relevant to the island marble and something that's worth talking about in broader contexts. So here's a here's a, a quote from a Fish and Wildlife Service officer. Now the Fish and Wildlife Service is, of course, who's going to knock on your door if you uh, you know harm an endangered species, right? They're they're responsible for this. Uh, the way that the Endangered Species Act is designed, you can only make a decision about the listing of a species solely based on science. I should actually read it from the Act. It says. The secretary, although the listing decision that usually gets deferred to the director, shall make determination solely on the basis of the best scientific and commercial data available. They can't look at economic factors. They can't look at social factors. That cannot come into play in terms of a listing determination of whether the species warrants protection under the act. So he's telling me that they can't look at social factors. They can't look at economic factors that listing the decisions should be based only on science by the letter of the law. Now, I think one way of looking at this that's interesting is, is these graphs that come from a European study, uh, Cardoso et al. from 2011. Um, so we are getting into Europe here, but I think that the same, there's enough research on this to show that the same phenomenon applies to the North American context. Um, up here in, in, in pie chart A, we have basically uh, you know, known species richness per taxon. So what, what animal species exist basically, right? So we've got you know, as might be expected, 82% arthropods here, 0.2% uh, mammals, 0.7% birds, right? This, this insects world. Uh, and B here, we have uh, funding. And again, this is euros, but we, we might see something similar. And there is research in the North American context as well. You see almost an inverted pie chart to show uh, the funding for, for mammals, for birds, for reptiles, for amphibians, for fish, and, and the rest kind of occupying that, that smaller part of the pie chart, right? So obviously we don't fund uh, conservation for species based solely on science. We also don't list based solely on science. There are a lot of social factors that come into play. Uh, uh, who's in charge politically? Who's petitioning for the endangered species? Like how much power does that organization have? How many lawsuits? Um, what's the public outcry against? What's the public outcry for? Uh, what's the species charisma, right? Do we, do we have any kind of uh, sense that people are going to want to see the species conserved? Now to talk a little bit more about what that conservation uh, uh, looks like in practice and some of the social factors therein. One of the social factors that I found to be most relevant is conflict. Um, anytime you have a collaboration, of course, you're going to have conflict over what to do, what's best to do, especially when the stakes are so high. Uh, and I think that conflict is about not just norms, that is behaviors and, and, and practices, but also values that it, it, those behaviors are, are nested in, you know, ideas of what's good and what's what's going to be most valuable. Uh, so here's a, a well, introduce it a little bit. Um, one of the, the, the major controversies that I found was uh, whether or not to use what's called mark release recapture, which is a common butterfly uh, uh, study practice. Essentially, you capture a butterfly, you, you mark one of its wings, you release it, and you hope to capture it later and know that you caught the same butterfly. This allows you to detect the number of butterflies that are out there, but also how far the butterflies travel and which direction they're traveling. A lot of information you can't get otherwise. Otherwise, you're sort of looking around and you're counting the butterflies. Um, but you risk hurting the butterfly because you're capturing it and you're handling it with your hands. And so here's a quote from someone who was for this practice, which again, has a lot of implications for what can be knowable about the butterfly. He says, I think personalities with regard to risk aversion versus not risk averse and how uh, one values the potential information that one might get versus the risks that one might have from getting the information. So, you know, the mark release we capture stuff is a good example. Yes, some butterflies could get hurt, uh, a fish and wildlife and a uh, service employee hurt one, yet there was also a bunch of really valuable information in my view that came out of that work. So he's referring to a specific moment in which a Fish and Wildlife Service employee was showing other people how to do this practice, 
and he actually tore the wings off of the butterfly in doing so. And here's a, a quote from uh, a lepidopterist on the other side of this debate. That kind of work where you handle butterflies is not done on endangered butterflies. I mean, you just don't handle it because you have the possibility of basically killing an adult. There's a possibility and it did happen with island marble, right? So arguing here that we don't wanna kill any adults and we also don't wanna kill any adults because this is a severely threatened species. Um, so you might ask yourself where you would fall on this debate. And, and at the end of the day, the truth is that we need to figure something, uh, a solution, right? There, there's not really a compromise here. You either use this or you don't. And so how these decisions are made is inherently social. I would say also, though, besides conflict over how to do things when people share the view that, that something should be conserved, we also have conflict over whether or not something should be conserved, depending on people or where people stand. So uh, a great example is in Washington state. Um, there's this battle between uh, ranchers who uh, probably rationally feel like their, their cattle are being uh, threatened, depending on where you stand on the issue, uh, by gray wolves, the populations are being maintained and, and protected, and conservationists, particularly, you know, conservationists that have that you know, PNW uh, environmental ethic who are looking at it and saying, no, the, you know, the death of any gray wolf or the destabilization of, of gray wolf packs is a, is a very, uh, you know, harmful thing to the environment, and not something that we should be engaging in. Um, and, and this is not just a discursive war, this is a war over who occupies positions in government agencies and who has the power to push the levers and, and see these policies realized one way or the other, of course, because people feel like their livelihoods or things that are very important to them are, are at stake here. And importantly, all of this takes place, I think, in another, uh, social, uh, another social component as well, that all of this takes place uh, not in a vacuum, but in a social world that is imbued with uh, many, many power dynamics. As all of us know, as we move around and occupy different places in society, uh, power is sort of everywhere. And then we are, you know, find ourselves at the top or the bottom, depending on our, our situation. Um, to illustrate this about the Island Marble, here's a quote from a nonprofit worker about that first listing decision and what happened there when it was declined. Uh, he says, ultimately, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service did not, as you know, did not list it, even though their biologists felt that it should be listed. Basically, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service did a positive 90-day finding and then reversed that in the last few months before it was released. They reversed it at the request of, and I've redacted the person's name, who was the, and I've redacted their position, of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. This is not an isolated incident of agency scientists, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service scientists, finding that an animal should be protected, and then the agency basically overrules their own scientists and makes the opposite decision. Not at all uncommon. So to be clear here, what's happening is the scientists that were responsible for this, it was their job to look at this and say, should this species be listed, said yes, unanimously. Um, but an official within Fish and Wildlife Service decided no, they, they single-handedly shot it down. And, and this is something that can happen uh, all the way up uh, through the Department of the Interior. And, and it also partially explains why different presidential administrations have different uh, rates of, of listing is because uh, people who are appointed to positions have the power to stall or, or shoot down listing decisions, uh, depending on where they are. So power is, is inherent to the it's conservation, whether we want it to be or not. We can pretend that the Endangered Species Act is making decisions only based on science. Uh, the reality that social science kind of uh, makes clear is that that's not quite the case. So to, to move toward talking about some solutions here really quickly, um, I want to start with one that's quite simple, that is sort of a very fixable problem, and then move to one that's a very complicated problem that requires a lot more social change. Um, so the first problem that I, I, I saw uh, as a social scientist investigating this case, or, or one problem, um, was when I was talking to uh, a, a, a National Park Service biological technician. And this is really the person who's most physically responsible for the labor of taking that butterfly out of that uh, uh, captive rearing lab and bringing it out and, and setting it free uh, in the wild. Uh, so the, sort of the, the labor of, of island marble um, conservation. So this person says, uh, I mean, you're essentially terminated at the end of this season and you have to get rehired. Whereas if you're a permanent seasonal, you know, it's kind of solidified. You don't have to get rehired every year. That would be ideal for me. And also I think ideal for the butterflies and the projects in general, just to keep things more consistent and spend more time actually doing what's needing to be done than learning every year or trying to teach new people every year. And so what he's saying here is, you know, not only is his job seasonal, um, he has to reapply for his job. It's a, it's a temporary seasonal position, right? The person that's, again, most responsible for, you know, physically maintaining this species existence, arguably, uh, has to reapply for his job. And, and, and you know, is selling, telling this to me because he has no other avenue uh, to explain it to, right? It's sort of a, a power dynamics, again, talking about a, a position in the social system, a position of, of being a, a temporary seasonal employee that doesn't 
you know, it doesn't quite register with the, the social system, uh, his importance. And just to kind of illustrate this, you know, this is a picture of him releasing one of these butterflies. And you can see it's not just about education and, and potentially training a new employee. It's about, you know, this requires experience. I mean, coaxing a, a butterfly that's just a closed from a chrysalis, right, that's new to the world, its, its wings are not ready to fly yet onto its host plant is something that probably requires a bit of experience or it would certainly benefit from a bit of experience. But then to move to a kind of broader uh, uh, social sort of issue, um, I'll let this quote kind of stand for itself, but it pertains to kind of institutions and organizational structures. So this environmental nonprofit leader says, if you're a military organization, for everything life and death depends on your ability to make a decision in the field, and you've got to be on top of it in 10 minutes. And as soon as you engage, it starts changing, and you have to keep changing your response. Well, if you're dealing with an ecosystem, it's the same thing. But our environmental institutions, I think they're very rigid uh, because they're just bureaucracies like all other bureaucracies. They're always lacking way behind science, way behind what we know and finding it difficult to catch up. And so what he, I think he's pointing out here is that conservation is largely the purview of universities, uh, one, and the government, uh, two, and then also nonprofits, which are kind of uh, caught in between, you know, requesting funding or, or gathering funding from, uh, the, you know, the populace and, and you know, uh, waiting on research as well, but largely it's universities and, and it's the government and both of those institutions are designed to do something very different from conservation. Conservation isn't their first goal. It certainly wasn't their first goal when they were organized in the way that they are. Um, so to expect them to be able to navigate uh, constant challenges in the field is uh, perhaps the wrong way of looking at it. And there are alternative structures for organizations to potentially explore. So I guess you might think about, again about monarchs and sort of just reflect on the fact that you know, again, they are they are going to come, uh, right? And so, to think, you know, maybe not from a military perspective about butterflies, but to think maybe strategically about that, um, they're going to arrive. And if we're sort of, you know, going to be allies to them, they have to have certain resources here, right? They're, they're going to move through Iowa. Um, if we're going to be antagonistic toward them, then we're going to deprive them of those resources. Uh, are we going to be able to adapt to any of that? Well, year over year, we we don't quickly probably adapt to something like that. That's not really what the system set up to do. It's set up to produce research and things like that. Um, but I, identifying alternative structures could also produce, you know, structures that are, you know, able to respond to the particular needs of these kinds of, of, of uh, initiatives. So as I talk about that, that probably sounds like a very big picture change. And I don't want to uh, acknowledge that when we start thinking sociologically about some of these things, when we start, start thinking uh, from a social scientific perspective in general, um, it does start to tend toward these conversations about big picture transformations, about land use, of course about economic forces that dictate land use in the Island Marbles case, something like tourism and housing in Iowa's case, of course, agriculture, the political forces that accompany those economic forces, and then cultural understandings, which are, of course, this broad social force as well. Um, that one maybe seems a little bit more tangible. Sure, we can go out and we can change people's hearts and minds about things. But we also want to make sure that we're addressing the fact that economic, political forces, land use, all of these things are intimately tied to conservation. If we don't address them, then conservation will just you know, permanently remain sort of the tail being wagged by the dog that is economics and politics, right? And, and so if we're serious about conservation, then we have to integrate them into these conversations or we have to integrate economics, politics, and, and culture into conversations about uh, conservation. And I would say, you know, if it does seem like it's un, you know, unchangeable or these things are too big, um, I think one thing that social science does tell us is that, uh, you know, not only do these, are these things changeable, but they're constantly changing. And, and probably that's, that's easy to see the older you get, I think, as well, is that, um, you know, the, 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 the transformations are, are practically inevitable, I think. And so it's, it's about, you know, harnessing an inability to, to, to use those transformations to, to implement these kinds of goals into those transformations, to, to notice where those transformations are happening and implement, let's say, conservation goals. And just to end here on, on one last slide, um, looking at uh, maybe Iowa's uh, migratory monarch butterflies from a sociological perspective. Again, I'm no expert as a sort of first uh, 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 for you know, impressions here, what social factors might be relevant. Uh, it seems like there's an initiative to kind of use roadside corridors or, or uh, corridors for electric power as, as a kind of migratory habitat. So the idea maybe is that we can use the same arteries and veins that humans use to, to move around the state or the country to allow uh, butterflies to, to migrate if we plant the, the correct vegetation uh, off, off, off of a road uh, a decent way. Um, there's, of course, possibilities for habitat maintenance by farmers, which is probably not a new conversation for, for anyone listening now. Uh, there are social factors that are going to determine uh, whether or not farmers want to adopt these kinds of practices, of course. Uh, it's different for renters and owners, but there are other factors as well. 
Um, of course, awareness, education, and outreach, as always, um, are going to impact you know, whether or not people know that the butterfly is, is quite endangered at this point, the monarch butterfly. Um, and then there's this listing decision that's sort of pending at this point. And so, you know, again, I, I'm not totally up on, on this particular case. My understanding is that the monarch vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Endangered Species Act is in a, a holding pattern where it's going to be considered uh, routinely. And eventually a listing decision could be made. Uh, and uh, will there be public support or opposition for that listing decision? What kinds of regulatory uh, consequences will blindside people or municipalities or counties? Uh, what kinds of conservation consequences will we have uh, of a listing decision? And kind of a last point here, uh, what we do have right now from the government, from the Fish and Wildlife Service, is a pre-listing uh, initiative called a uh, Candidate Conservation Agreement with Assurances. And uh, what this is, is basically there are certain landowner groups who can opt in uh, to a deal in which they set aside some of their land for uh, butterfly habitat for monarchs, for migratory monarchs. And uh, if they do so, then they're going to be protected from some of the downsides of something like the species suddenly being listing, uh, listed, rather. Uh, things like incidental take, which means accidentally killing some of these butterflies, right? So uh, those kinds of social uh, uh, factors are, I think, relevant to the monarch. There's probably many more. Um, but of course, these are the things to keep an eye on if we're interested in, in uh, monarch conservation. And that's kind of my point broadly is there are just so many social factors relevant to butterfly conservation, to species conservation. And I think uh, the benefits of integrating uh, more fully uh, social science into those uh, conservation efforts, not just you know producing articles, but into some conservation practice, I think are, are enormous. And that's something that I don't think I'm just saying, but I think this coming out of conservation, uh, conservation is smiles all over the country. So thank you very much. That, that's really the end of my presentation. I'll move to the next slide here. Some references and then, yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much, John. Um, and if you are watching this webinar for a CCA CEU credit, go ahead and send me an email by 5 p.m. today. Uh, my email is alenaw at iastate.edu. Again, A-L-E-N-A-W at iastate.edu uh, with your name, name you entered to watch the webinar, and then your CCA number by 5 p.m. today. If you want to go to the next slide, please. Uh, if you watched this webinar, please fill out our voluntary demographic survey. If you've already watched one in 2023 and filled out the survey, you do not have to complete it again. It is just a one-time survey uh, for the year, for this year. And then the next slide, please. And then join us next week. We'll have Brooke Wilkie from um, the Kellogg Biological Station talking about designing cropping systems for efficiency, environmental performance, and more profit. Again, that's next week at noon. Uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to go ahead and put them in the chat. Otherwise, I'll start asking the questions we've gotten so far. Um, this question says, so currently the island marble butterfly, uh, you said the numbers are in the hundreds. What numbers, if you're speaking of just numbers, what numbers do that does that have to be at to be removed from the endangered species list? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's, uh, you know, a, a great example of why I would say that natural science always needs to be sort of the, the cornerstone of conservation, because I think, you know, an entomologist or a, a, a lepidopterist could answer this question much better. The interesting thing about butterflies and some insect species is that their populations under the right conditions can actually explode, right? If, if they lay quite a number of eggs, if, if those eggs are able to find the resources they need and not, you know, have the, the predators that they don't need, um, then you could suddenly see a huge uh, boom back of, a, of, a, of an insect species or a butterfly species. So it's not impossible to think. Um, uh, however, I think, you know, another thing to consider is why species are listed, why they, they gain steam, why they gain the, the social steam behind a, a listing like petition. And part of that tends to be that they're looked at as species that could potentially maintain ecosystems. And so there are sort of those, I don't want to say ulterior motives, but, you know, ulterior benefits uh, uh, potentially. And so I think with the island marble, maybe some of the hope is to bring back some of those coastal prairies that have really been stripped back. I don't have the numbers off my head, but, uh, you know, a lot, you know, I want more than 80, 90 percent of what was what was there in, in Washington state and in Oregon. And so. Um, yeah, I, I don't know the specific numbers, but I think they're they're also taking into consideration things like uh, how many different populations are there? Has it spread to the mainland? Has it spread to different islands? It's not just about the raw numbers. Um, 
nor was the listing decision. It's also about things like, um, you know, does it, the, are the plants that it's going to need viable uh, for maintaining an ecosystem and, and concerns like that. So yeah, I can't really answer the question just being too much of a social scientist, but there, those are some of the other concerns relevant. Awesome. Um, and this next question, uh, the person said that they know that you didn't do a whole lot of research on this, but that um, Minnesota's success story of the 8% have only been transferred. Do you know what ed agencies or like who was focusing on a lot of that education and outreach for that? Yeah, I happen to know that the University of Minnesota is really involved with that. And so um, I don't know, again, yeah, thank you. For, you know, I don't know too much about it. I think probably Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, Minnesota is going to have a state agency as well. And I don't know the name of Minnesota's uh, state agency, unfortunately, but it'll have some sort of Fish and Wildlife State Agency. Um, and yeah, that state agency probably has a, a uh, like a terrestrial and a marine division, and it's probably that marine division working closely with uh, uh, University of Minnesota probably uh, are the, the two major, major players working on that initiative, I would imagine. Perfect. All right. Well, that is all of the questions we, oh, hold on. One just came in. Um, does the marble butterfly have a specific plant species it needs? Uh, like, you know, like the monarch has the milkweed that it needs, or is the marble butterfly just more generally prairies? Yeah, it does. It has four known species. Um, I, I won't list them all for you, but the one that it, it's most reliant on, as, as far as I understand, and, and again, um, you know, I, I, do, I don't want to speak out of turn, uh, is Brassica rapa is a, is, a, is a mustard plant. And, and then that's, again, non-native, I think, but it's just the most efficient for the butterfly. Uh, you know, there were interesting conversations based on the fact that the butterfly wasn't relying on its, on, its, on its own native plant, but that leads to conversations about, you know, the idea of plants being native or non-native and can non-natives be non-native without being invasive, right? And so I think w w the case of the butterfly, everyone was perfectly happy to allow this mustard to persist and to kind of, uh, you know, populate through the prairie because it was good for this purpose. And maybe it has some other negative consequences for things like voles. I'm not quite sure. Uh, those were conversations, but it's been, a, it's been a couple of years, but uh, I, my, my sense was that it was a, a non-native that was not considered uh, invasive that it's most reliant on right now that would be happy to propagate elsewhere. Perfect. Um, another question. What does it look like to start integrating social sciences more here in Iowa with our conservation outreach efforts with farmers? Yeah, so I know there's a little bit of this work being done from, you know, the sociology department. I'm sure there's there's more social scientific work uh, happening in other departments. I think what it looks like is uh, using all of the different social scientific methods. So not just the methods I used here, not just interviews, not just ethnography, although I think that's a huge part of it because it, it uncovers things that otherwise you, know, you wouldn't quite see, um, but surveys uh, and, and uh, you know, speaking with farmers, asking farmers what they're concerned about, asking them what kinds of obstacles they would have to uh, implementing something like butterfly habitat, whether those obstacles are structural or they're cultural, um, they're probably going to be social. And then, you know, from listening to them, finding solutions to that. So I think it's it's kind of solutions oriented, collaborative, interdisciplinary. That's at least the way that I, I think it would it would best uh, take place is sort of uh, definitely from a listening kind of public sociology. So, so sociology, not just for the purpose of, of producing knowledge, but for, for also helping people and, and serving a, a population from the from the university or from from the government. Perfect. Okay, well, it looks like now uh, those are all the questions we've gotten. So uh, thank you for this presentation and thank you everyone for all of your questions. Again, next week we'll have uh, Brooke Wilkie with the Kellogg Biological Station talking about designing cropping systems for efficiency, environmental performance, and more profit. Uh, thanks for attending today. Would you like anything else to add, John? <laughs> no, just thank you. Yeah. Okay, perfect.